this particular piece has a lot to do with trying to reveal as much as possible about my process, about yeah. about how it's, and I, when I say my process, it's just the, the way I've, I've worked with it, to try to let as much of uh, the variables come clearly uh, through. What you're seeing here is also what you're hearing, a specific visual representation of sounds. In an excerpt from the polychromatic version of Delayed Pulses, Tim Forcade's most complex and fully realized piece of electronic artwork to date. Later in this program, we'll show you the complete monochromatic version of this piece as we profile yet another of Lawrence's most intriguing creators. I stopped doing everything that had to do with with traditional graphics or with traditional, you know, painting, etc., uh, in the '60s, when I, you know, or really in the '70s when I began to study. About 1970, I just hmm. stopped in order to uh, to get. It, it just took that much involvement, and uh, it seemed the other things were distractions, and I just wanted to to uh, settle on this and work hmm. with it. Tim Forcade would like you to know that, first of all, despite reports to the contrary, he is not a wizard. Now, it is true that he did build or rebuild a good number of the electronic components you see here in the control room of his North Lawrence studio. It's also true that he painstakingly manipulates them to produce certain desired artistic effects. But he maintains that he doesn't always know why it all works the way it does, nor does he think you need an electronics background to enjoy it. Sound like an obsession? Well, probably, but Forcade points out that it's really just a logical extension of the artwork he's done so far. Well, I began as a painter, like you said, uh, working systematically uh, with uh, geometries, various types of geometries, and uh, uh, grid networks, systematizing these, assigning colors to them, breaking them up in different ways and then began to work with kinetics, motors, uh, lights, and systematizing that in various different ways, uh, imposing uh, time grids, maybe, if you will, over those uh, in such a way to, uh, as to uh, reveal different things about the process. It's just, it's just moved mm -hmm. from, that, from that point. This was mostly, what, uh, what years? Uh, I began, I think, Working systematically in the 60s as a student, as an undergraduate, in mm -hmm. fact. Was someone encouraging you particularly in this direction, or is it something you just had no, in your mind? It just seemed like the thing to do at the time. You know, I, uh, I just became interested in it, less interested in expressive painting. Mm -hmm. uh, it, just wasn't, it just wasn't interesting to me. And I, when I started working with light, uh, the, the raw and real rich saturated qualities that it had over paint, over reflection, uh, from then I just, you know, became obsessed that with That carried it. you along. Yeah. Uh -huh. Someone would almost think you had a, a mathematics background if they follow what you're saying here. Is that true? Or? No, I have, I don't have any technical background to speak of. Uh, I've studied this on my own and, uh, in fact, failed miserably algebra and <laughs> all those other things. Mm -hmm. I was terrible in sciences. Now, at some point, you took a course in electronics. I think you even got your FCC license, too. I took a course in, in that at one point, thinking that, uh, the, that the theory would help me know exactly how to create the images that I wanted mm -hmm. to create. And I discovered that what I ended up with was an FCC license, period. Uh, and uh, that it, it really didn't help me in terms of, of uh, realizing how to make these marks mm -hmm. and how to work with this. Mm -hmm. What did help you? Books and experience. I, uh, I just began to uh, acquire equipment and uh, acquire uh, books on the subject and there are a lot of circuit books, build this uh, in your own, mm -hmm. own home, etc. 
And I had the experience just, I started building kits, for instance, electronic kits mm -hmm. uh, for amplifiers and stereophonic equipment. And uh, began to understand how circuit boards were laid out and how they actually operated. And, and from that, I, uh, I began to build and began to create my own circuits and watch them, uh, watch them modulate light bulbs or uh, uh, more recently uh, modulate actual lines and uh, graphics. Orcade's attempts to modulate those lines and graphics in new and different ways have been displayed at area galleries numerous times over the past several years. His newest piece, Delayed Pulses, continues to refine some of the techniques he's been working on. But most simply, the piece allows a viewer to see music created by 4K on a tone oscillator as a visual image. The sounds from the oscillator are filtered through a video sync signal, which is then fed into a monitor, and in the case of the polychromatic version, altered by a color wheel. I uh, gradually worked, the, worked the, the piece together over a period of about six weeks. Uh, working on a daily, pretty much daily basis mm -hmm. with it. Uh, I use a uh, documenting process which is not, a, not particularly like uh, music notation at all, and yet uh, makes it very clear for me exactly what I did, exactly what voicing was involved, and uh, what's necessary for me to uh, recreate the process for recording purposes. Mm -hmm. the, the final piece is on a uh, on a two-track cassette tape and is endlessly looped uh, and displayed at the same time from that loop. So what you see is exactly the same as what you're hearing. I mean, they're absolutely linked. They, if, you, if you turn the sound off, you lose the image, mm -hmm. so they're bound together. Mm -hmm. Now, you have no particular musical training either, right? No, no, I haven't. <laughs> you worked with the tone oscillator just uh, as an outgrowth, once again, of everything else that you've done. Well, I gradually built the process up by uh, looking at images uh, for years and years and studying electronic images for years. I've, I've begun, I, I think I've, I feel I've learned something about it to the extent that I can make a statement about it now. Uh, when I first started working with the graphics, it frightened me. It scared me because the, the, gra the graphics themselves, I couldn't make an, a decision. I couldn't say, I like this, I don't like that. I, mm -hmm. I was uh, just right up against the wall. I've worked with it long enough now that I've begun to understand a lot more about it. And my understanding of the musical aspects of it are a direct outgrowth of my understanding of it visually. So what I'm doing is writing music based on visual criteria. One of the interesting things about this piece is it's the first time I've ever done a uh, videotape, produced a videotape of it. Uh, the image is quite different, uh, and the fact that it, it's, it's going out uh, over the air to people makes it almost a theatrical piece in a way. It almost it involves people in it in a way that I'm uh, not at all used to, <laughs> because if I mean, if, if the uh, television, for obvious reasons, if the television monitor isn't, isn't set up in a certain way, why uh, the color goes to hell. Uh, one of the reasons that I'm interested in, in uh, and I produced two versions, a color version and a monochromatic version, was to see what would happen to the image. And I feel like the monochromatic version has translated much better. Uh, it seems much more consistent with the original image. And it also seems much more immune to what other people could do to it. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. you know, turn up the red, Carl. It won't matter to the extent that it will in the color. The color is is very, very uh, fragile. Just you know, extremely fragile. Well, let's talk about reactions to the piece. Uh, at this stage of the game, is there any particular reaction that you've noticed from people who've been seeing the work? It, this raises questions that a lot of other work raises. It's, there's a lot, it allows for an awful lot of, of uh, different qu questions to be raised. Uh -huh. And for that reason, you get everything. You know, I've, had, I've had people actually send my uh, invitations to shows, my announcements, that is, to shows back to me, saying things like, uh, I, I wouldn't want to see this under any circumstances, <laughs> and things like that. You know, and, it's, and I've also had people just really uh, love the work, or apparently love the work. Uh, 
I think the the uh, broadest uh, grouping is one of just curiosity. People are very curious about how the image uh, was made, and then when I tell them I'm not an electronics uh, mm -hmm. engineer or anything like that, they become uh, you know real curious at that point about the imagery.
Okay, Tim, let's say at this point in time you've gotten enough positive feedback from delayed pulses that you'll be doing more in the future. What have you learned from this project that we'll be seeing in future works? Well, I think it's important to say first that uh, it doesn't matter uh, it doesn't matter in terms of doing the work whether I get positive reinforcement or not. Uh, I do the work because of my own compulsion to do the work. Uh, so I will be producing and in fact am producing uh, for an upcoming show uh, an another series of works uh, based on uh, rituals and based on uh, more on natural sounds. Uh, my own voice in particular I'm interested in the placement, my placement in, in this instance, or a choir's placement in the world relative to these, to these sounds and images. I'm interested in the notion of, of, you know, what is this? What is that mark? What, what are these images and, and how do they relate to the sound? And I'm interested in, in actually putting myself in that image uh, in a way which uh, maybe has precedent in the same way MTV where somebody's dancing around and, and they're beginning to in a way merge with the sound. Mm -hmm. uh, this is like I am the sound, I become the sound. Uh, I'm interested in that as a ritual and relating it to other rituals mm -hmm. through, uh, through readings and so I've been working with that using the electronics uh, to either process or, or to uh, accompany uh, the voicing. Is this an expensive thing to be doing? Uh, well, it has been. I've uh, since I build or design most of it myself. It's a lot less expensive uh, than it appears. Uh, I'm becoming less interested in in uh, uh, continuously reinventing the wheel when I come up against the instance, for instance, where I need a mixer. I mean, you know, uh, I'm I'm trying to go out and not become involved with with uh, continually doing that and, you know, say, okay, I'll just buy a mixer, uh, mm -hmm. you know. So, it, it, yeah, it's, it's kind of expensive. I heard a, th a thing on the radio today about a robotics show. A uh, uh, man named Seawright, a sculptor, electronic uh, sculptor, uh, was talking to, being interviewed, mm -hmm. and was talking about how incredibly expensive it is uh, working with traditional media even, using uh, traditional media, for instance, in bronze or something, huge, mm -hmm. you know, monumental marble and bronze sculptures, oil painting, all of it is incredibly expensive, particularly when you, you know, take the idea that uh, it won't necessarily come back to you, you know, it, it, uh, it's, I work, for instance, to work, mm -hmm. you know, like a lot of artists do.